do apologize for the several uh, delays. It's just been that kind of a day. A couple things at the top, and then we'll uh, we'll get to your questions. So, first and f foremost, I want to uh, read out for you that uh, Secretary Austin spoke with his uh, Polish counterpart this morning to discuss Russia's unprovoked aggression in Ukraine. He thanked Minister Blaschak for Poland's extraordinary support of U.S. troops in the country, including those who have been recently sent there on temporary orders. He noted the hard work and the diligence with which the Poles have been welcoming and taking care of Ukrainians who continue to flee across their borders, some 1.2 million now. Secretary also made clear how much he's looking forward to attending in person next week's NATO Defense Ministerial in Brussels. Now, the Secretary also had a chance to discuss with Minister Blaschak the proposal to send MiG-29 fighter aircraft to Ukraine, and specifically the notion of doing so by way of transfer to U.S. custody. Secretary Austin thanked the, the Minister for Poland's willingness to continue to look for ways to assist Ukraine. But he stressed that we do not support the transfer of additional fighter aircraft to the Ukrainian Air Force at this time and therefore have no desire to see them in our custody either. Let me walk you through the reasons for this. First, we believe the best way to support Ukrainian defense is by providing them the weapons and the systems that they need most to defeat Russian aggression, in particular anti-armor and air defense. We, along with other nations, continue to send them these weapons, and we know that they are being used with great effect. The slowed Russian advance in the north and the contested airspace over Ukraine is evidence alone of that. Although Russian air capabilities are significant, their effectiveness has been limited due to Ukrainian strategic, operational, and tactical ground-based air defense systems, surface-to-air missiles, and manpads. Secondly, the Ukrainian Air Force currently has several squadrons of fully mission-capable aircraft. We assess that adding aircraft to the Ukrainian inventory is not likely to significantly change the effectiveness of the Ukrainian Air Force relative to Russian capabilities. Therefore, we believe that the gain from transferring those MiG-29s is low. And finally, the intelligence community has assessed that the transfer of MiG-29s to Ukraine may be mistaken as escalatory and could result in a significant Russian reaction that might increase the prospects of a military escalation with NATO. Therefore, we also assess the transfer of the MiG-29s to Ukraine to be high risk. And we are grateful for the superb support and cooperation of our Polish allies who continue to host thousands of our troops and who are welcoming more, as I said, more than one million Ukrainian refugees. Polish generosity is clearly on display for the whole world to see. But at this time, we believe the provision of additional fighter aircraft provides little increased capabilities at high risk. We also believe that there are alternative options that are much better suited to support the Ukrainian military in their fight against Russia, and we will continue to pursue those options. Again, we thank Poland for their incredible level of support and cooperation. Poland is a valued ally and a very good friend. We look forward to exploring ways to deepen that partnership in this critical moment. We also know the Ukrainian armed forces, as well as average Ukrainian citizens, are defending their country with great skill and bravery. We will continue to look for ways to help them do that, knowing full well that that effort is in no way made more effective or less harmful to the Ukrainian people by steps we take or decisions we make which lead to an escalation of that conflict. I might add, just before coming out here, the secretary wrapped up uh, a phone call with the Ukrainian defense minister, Minister Reznikov, uh, as one of his ongoing series of calls with counterparts. We'll have a more re a detailed readout of that call uh, later. The call really just concluded, so I don't have much context to provide for you there. Now, on another note, approximately 3,000 U.S. Marines will join some 30,000 military forces from 27 NATO ally and partner nations for the Norwegian-led exercise Cold Response, which kicks off Monday the 14th of, of March. 
This is the ninth iteration of this multi-domain extreme cold weather exercise designed to enhance our collective military capabilities in the demanding Arctic environment. This exercise will emphasize and test critical activities ranging from the reception of reinforcements and interoperable command and control to combined joint operations in a highly intense combat environment. In total, approximately 220 aircraft and more than 50 ships will take part in the exercise. U.S. forces began training in Norway in December as U.S. Marine units conducted cold weather training and planning in the lead up to this exercise. Two Marine Expeditionary Force will be the largest American military unit participating this year. Some 200 military vehicles, attack and assault support aircraft and equipment departed Camp Lejeune, uh, North Carolina in January as part of that unit's participation. Uh, and again, uh, we, uh, we look forward to a terrific exercise, cold response, and uh, the exercise will be running through April 1st. And with that, we'll get the questions. Bob. Thank you, John. Um, with regard to the Polish proposal on, on the MiG transfers, uh, would it be correct to say that you just closed the door uh, on this transfer, whether it's done through the United States or through any other NATO country? And secondly, separately but related, you, you referenced alternative options that you're looking at. Can you sure. explain what that is? Alternative options are uh, um, uh, working with uh, other allies uh, and uh, partner nations uh, around the world who may have um, additional air defense uh, capabilities and systems uh, at their disposal who might be willing to provide them to Ukraine. Um, and so we're, we're having discussions with many countries right now about um, some of those capabilities, surface air missiles, for instance, uh, that the Ukrainians are m more trained and more equipped to 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 operate. Um, so uh, it, it could include additional man pads as well, um, and certainly anti uh, anti tank uh, uh, anti armor, excuse me, um, systems. So. We're going to continue to talk to the Ukrainians about their needs, um, and we're going to continue to talk to allies and partners about how to best fill those needs. Uh, but it's our assessment uh, right now, for all the reasons that I, I gave you, that, uh, that we don't believe additional aircraft is, uh, is the most effective answer to meeting those needs uh, in the conflict. Now, look, uh, sovereign nations can decide for themselves what they want to do, but, uh, but this idea, the proposal of, of transferring these jets to our custody, then for then transferring to Ukraine, uh, that is something that we are not going to explore right now. Jen. Are you talking about providing S-300 missile defense systems? I'm not, I'd rather stay away from the actual systems themselves, uh, Jen. We're going to continue to look uh, at a broad swath of, uh, uh, of capabilities that the Ukrainians uh, uh, could use uh, effectively. Some of them they already are, and maybe they need replacements, um, and, but I'm not going to get into individual systems. And what's the difference in providing javelins and stingers to the Ukrainians versus MiGs or fighter jets? Why is that more provocative from an intelligence perspective? Why is that seen as more provocative? Um, it seems like you're splitting hairs there. No, there's no splitting hairs, Jen. I think uh, we, we take seriously the intelligence community's assessments um, and their views uh, based on the information that uh, that they have available to them, um, and it's their assessment, one in which the, the secretary uh, concurs that uh, that the transfer of combat aircraft right now could be mistaken uh, by Mr. Putin and the Russians as an escalatory step. And as I said at the very end of my opening statement, we need to be careful about every decision we make um, a, 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 that that we aren't m making the potential for escalation worse. Because that's not only not good for NATO, and it's not only not good for the United States and our national security, should this conflict e escalate uh, even further, but it's certainly not going to be good for the Ukrainian people uh, to, to have uh, what is already uh, a destructive and terrible war get even more destructive and terrible, uh, given the fact that, uh, that, that Mr. Putin has other uh, capabilities at, at his disposal. Fadi. Thank you, John. Uh, I have two questions. So the first one is on this whole issue of MiG-29. Uh, as you know, this this uh, the prospect of delivering MiG-29s to Ukraine is what was raised by President Zelensky. Uh, and uh, based on the assessment that you just told us, this is not the most effective way. 
are the Ukrainians now on board with this assessment, or they're still insisting? That, have you been in communication with the, with the Ukrainians on, on this issue exactly? Well, I just told you that the secretary just finished up a call with Minister Reznikov. I don't have a readout for you right now. It literally was finishing up as I was walking here to the podium. So we'll have a readout for you. Um, I doubt seriously that that readout is going to uh, ascribe the the sentiments of the Ukrainians, that is for them to speak to. And I will, uh, obviously, we defer to the Ukrainian government to, 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 uh, to speak to this on their own. And, and on this issue of um, uh, military biological um, labs in Ukraine that the Russians keep uh, raising, yeah. can you basically explain to us what type of relationship, if any, there was between the Pentagon and the Ukrainian side on any biological labs uh, and when was the last cooperation, and what do you have to say about these Russian accusations? The Russian accusations uh, are absurd. They're laughable. And, uh, you know, in the words of my Irish Catholic grandfather, a bunch of malarkey. There's nothing to it. It's classic Rus Russian propaganda. And, uh, and uh, I wouldn't, uh, if I were you, I, I wouldn't give it... Uh, I wouldn't give it a drop of ink worth worth paying attention to. Yeah, but, but uh, can you explain to us what it, has there been any relationship between the? We Americans? are not not developing biological or chemical weapons inside Ukraine. It's not happening. Yeah. Thanks, John. Go ahead. Go, go ahead. Is there any concern that, that, that Russia is actually doing this because they're planning some sort of a, a chem biological? Yeah, attack? court. I mean, again, not being perfectly inside the minds of the Russians, uh, we have seen one of their playbooks is to accuse the other of uh, that which you are doing or which you plan to do, uh, and to create uh, uh, to create a narrative that uh, of victimhood and uh, and blaming somebody for else for something that you're in fact going to do. I have no evidence of that. I'm not suggesting that that's in the offing right now. Um, I have no intelligence in indicators that uh, that that type of weaponry is in Ukraine and being planned to be used. So I want to be clear. But it is of a piece of the Russian playbook uh, to blame others for that which you are about to do or you're, you're considering doing. That's a, we've done, they've done that plenty of times before. And then on intelligence, since you, you said that the U.S. intelligence assessment is that the transferring of the combat aircraft was considered high risk. Was there a, what was the assessment of transferring javelins and stingers? Is there can, was it also high risk? But the decision, the calculus was, the Ukrainians needed them, so it was worth it. Um, without getting into specific inventory uh, issues, um, the short answer to your question, Court, is, is is yes. I mean, as we as we make the decisions to provide support uh, from the very beginning, even before the invasion, but certainly since. Um, uh, we go through that calculus and to make sure that we are giving them what we believe um, uh, can be best suited to their needs. And we see that they're using, I mean, they're using it with great effect. Um, uh, but, uh, but also keeping in mind, as we must, the potential escalation of the conflict. So, so it's a calculation we do routinely, iteratively, Every day. So it is, it's not uncommon, the, the, the stingers, the javelins, or let's say anti-armor, anti-air equipment that the U.S. has been providing to them, some of those have been considered high risk, but the calculus is... I, I wouldn't say uh, everything that we're sending we consider to be high risk. Um, and um, without characterizing something as high or low risk, in, in particular uh, on the, the, the other inventory items, I would just tell you that we go through that calculus with every shipment that we that we send, what what is best needed to the to the fight, and, uh, and with, with a mind that uh, that uh, we obviously don't want to uh, needlessly or heedlessly escalate the conflict uh, to to a level where it's actually more dangerous for U Ukraine, not not less. Okay. Yeah, Travis. I'm sorry. Thanks, John. Um, the soldiers who were deployed to Poland, the 82nd, they had been helping small numbers of Americans who had been coming across the border right. from Ukraine. And you mentioned the massive refugee flow coming in now. I'm wondering if their mission, um, if it has, or if you're looking at potentially expanding that to a wider humanitarian mission, and is that something that maybe you've discussed with the with Poland? There hasn't been any active discussions of expanding their missions to something wider in terms of humanitarian assistance. Um, but 
I, I can assure you that the, the secretary will want us to be as responsive as possible should there be a need for that. But uh, we're, we're not uh, tracking uh, a request to expand the, the mission set for the 82nd right now. They certainly have that capability should they be needed, and we certainly would want to pitch in and help. Uh, but, uh, but we're in constant discussions uh, with Polish authorities as well as the State Department. And again, should there be a, a need for that, um, you can bet the United States military will, will chip in and help. And, and the, I would add, um, and, and I don't want this to at all sound gratuitous, but the, the Poles have been doing an amazing job um, harboring, welcoming, uh, and taking care of now more than a million Ukrainians that, uh, that have uh, fled across that border. And that's, that's only, I guess, by the UN estimates, about half of the total that have left the country. But the, uh, but the Polish government and the Polish people have just been superb, just uh, absolutely spectacular. And again, if they need our help in that regard, certainly the United States military would be positively disposed to look at those requests. Carla. Um, thank you. Uh, since we're talking about Poland, a defense official said that Russia had launched more than 710 missiles into Ukraine since the war began. Have any of those, or how close have those missiles come to the Polish border? Um, uh, what I would tell you, uh, Carla, without getting into uh, too much detail here, the, the uh, almost all of um, the missiles that have been fired from either inside Ukraine or from outside Ukraine have been uh, have been targeted uh, at sites uh, in the eastern part of the country. Um, if you were to draw a line from Kiev down to Odessa, straight line, uh, almost all of those strikes are occurring to the east of that line. So nothing, uh, nothing. Uh, close that we've seen to to Poland or even in, even in Western Ukraine, quite frankly. And then a quick follow on the uh, humanitarian corridors that keep you know trying to be established and then failing. Yeah. Um, does the Pentagon consider it a war crime to establish a humanitarian corridor and then bomb it? Yeah, the, the Pentagon's not making judgments on uh, war crimes. Uh, the, we'll, we'll leave that to the experts. Uh, uh, what I would tell you is that. Uh, Short of stopping the invasion, which is really what needs to happen here, short of that, we want to see that innocent civilians uh, uh, are given safe passage and not being harmed. And they ought to be given safe passage. Again, they shouldn't have to have a safe passage. But if they're going to, it ought to be to places inside their own country, inside Ukraine, not aimed at the north and to Belarus and Russia. I think the Ukrainians can be forgiven for not wanting to flee into the very countries that have invaded them. Um, and so uh, we, would, uh, we would obviously like to see, if there's going to be safe passage, that it's truly safe passage inside their own country, and unmolested, by the way, from Russian attacks, which has not always been the case in the last few days, calling for a safe passage, calling for corridors, uh, and, then, uh, and then hitting people while they're trying to use those corridors, killing people in the midst of evacuating. Uh, again, I'll, I'll leave the... The, the legal scrutiny to, to others, uh, uh, but, uh, but clearly what, what we want to see is, um, is for the destruction and the death to, to stop, and short of that, to, 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 uh, to be observed, the, the humanitarian concerns to be observed by the Russian military. Orrin. Uh, are you actively discouraging the transfer of fighter jets to Ukraine, or, or is it the position that the U.S. won't be part of this and it remains a, a Polish decision? And then separately, uh, have you assessed the Russians have used thermobaric weaponry in Ukraine? No indications that thermobaric weapons, no, no evidence of that that I can speak to. And, and look, uh, what I'm talking about today is this particular proposal about the MiG-29s. Um, as I mentioned to Bob, uh, sovereign nations unilaterally are deciding to make decisions about to providing security assistance to Ukraine, and they have that right to do that, and it's not our place to speak for them or, or what they may want to do. Uh, we just felt it was important since uh, this proposal involved a transfer to U.S. custody and that, that, that we uh, believed it was important to lay flat our concerns about that, and that's what we've done here. Yeah, David. So the, uh, the order to deploy patriots into Poland, mm -hmm. defense officials said this morning that Secretary Austin had ordered that. I always thought that kind of internal movement was ordered by General Walters. So one, why was it ordered by Secretary Austin? And two, what changed? 
to uh, convince him that he should put patriots forward in Poland. Was there any kind of aerial incident? Was there uh, a failure of the deconfliction line? Was there another intelligence community assessment that the risk was higher? I mean, what, what changed from before he ordered the Patriots until now? Uh, the, no, no one thing uh, precipitated this move. Uh, we have been talking now for weeks uh, about uh, our willingness and our capability of moving assets around in theater uh, given uh, the, the conditions on the ground, given the, what was then a looming invasion and now what has been uh, a quite destructive invasion in Ukraine. And the secretary has never been one to take off the table options uh, to relocate our assets as he believes is best suited to defense of NATO territory. This was one of those decisions. Um, uh, it wasn't precipitated by one single moment or one single issue or one single uh, uh, act by the Russians, but rather by a, a, a constant and routine consultation with our NATO allies, uh, in this case uh, Poland, about, uh, about the needs and the capabilities that would best suit uh, our obligations to Article 5. Uh, and as for the orders given, I mean, clearly General Walters gave the order. They are in his theater. And you're right. He absolutely has that authority. And he, and he made that order. But he did it at the direction of the secretary, based on the secretary's consultation with, uh, uh, with, our, uh, with our allies and partners. I mean, that's, uh, that's not unusual at all. That's very typical of how things are, are done here. Matt. Hi, John. We saw the Ukrainians uh, claim that a maternity and children's hospital in Mariupol was hit directly by, by Russian strike. Do you have anything on that or any of the other um, civilian casualties that you're seeing at this point? I'm afraid I don't. Uh, I've seen those same reports you have, but we're not in a position to be able to independently verify that. Um, obviously, uh, that's a horrific outcome. Uh, regardless of whether it was intentional or not, uh, 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 if it's true and we have no reason to doubt it's, it, that it's true, we just can't independently verify. I mean, it's just another indicator of, of, of uh, the, the supreme sacrifices that the Ukrainian people are making and that they shouldn't have to make. Uh, uh, you know, we're, we're talking, you know, families, children, um, killed, wounded, displaced, all of it, all of it avoidable. All of it completely avoidable. And on the casualties count, I, again, we're, we're being very careful here uh, to not uh, get into estimates uh, of casualties. Obviously, we know there have been casualties, civilian casualties. Um, Ukrainian soldiers ha have suffered casualties as well. Um, and we know the Russians have. But we're being very careful not to get into estimates of numbers. Uh, they, they, these estimates are, they, they vary widely. They change literally every day, if not every hour. Um, and again, it's not an operation we're conducting, and so uh, we, we don't feel like we have the confidence to be able to put out specific numbers. John, we're also seeing reports of unguided munitions being used. Um, are you seeing that, and is that factoring into the, the civilian casualties? Yeah, we do have indications that, uh, I mean, that, that uh, uh, not everything that the Russians are, uh, are using and their long-range fires are precision-guided. Uh, that uh, that that a number of a number of munitions are are not, and therefore not precise. Uh, which of course just raises the likelihood and the chances of civilian casualties and and uh, and damage to civilian infrastructure. It, it not precise, but even even in their use of precise weapon systems, uh, or so-called precise by Russian. Uh, accounts. I mean, we have seen, again, civilian infrastructure hit and civilian casualties uh, caused. Tara. Hi, John. Um, how concerned is the Pentagon that the risk that this could escalate into a nuclear conflict has increased? And did that weigh into the decision to say the U.S. would not have a role in transferring MiGs to Ukraine? Well, I think I laid it out pretty clearly in my opening statement that the, the risk of uh, escalation certainly factored into uh, our thinking on this uh, MiG-29 proposal, um, and I, I uh, again, I, I want to be careful here that we're not getting into intelligence assessments about potential outcomes. Russia is a nuclear power. There's no question about that. 
um, and nobody stands to gain if this conflict, which is already so deadly, gets even more deadly um, uh, because of the potential for a broader, deeper, wider, um, and non-conventional conflict. So we're we're uh, we're certainly mindful of that of that threat. And as I said at the at the outset. Uh, we want to make sure that whatever decisions we make, whatever support we give, whatever leadership we show, uh, it, it is not uh, in, a, in a way that makes the conflict escalatory. Related to that, um, has the Pentagon noticed any changes to Russia's nuclear posture or have any changes been made to the U.S. Uh, deterrent posture um, in the days since uh, Putin announced his own change? I would answer the question I, uh, the same way I've been uh, doing it, Tara, without getting into specifics. Uh, I can assure you that we are comfortable with, uh, with our strategic deterrent posture as it is. And I'll just leave there. So we. Hello, John. Uh, to go back to the Patriots, um, uh, is Poland the only NATO country that has requested Patriots? Um, I could ask, uh, do, do you plan to deploy Patriots everywhere in the region, anywhere else in the region. I'm not aware of any other requests for Patriot missile batteries, and uh, so I have no, no plans or no, uh, no, uh, no, no future redeployments to speak to today, Sylvie. Now you've uh, clarified the Pentagon's position on the jet transfers. <clears throat> excuse me, but it was a sharp contrast from what Secretary Blinken said over the weekend about giving uh, the green light for those transfers. Are the Pentagon and the State Department currently on the same page when it comes to the situation in Russia and Ukraine? Yeah, absolutely, we are. I mean, you're, you're talking about uh, uh, comments that were made, uh, you know, over the course of the of last weekend uh, when this was a a, a nascent idea. Um, and we were absorbing that idea, and we were talking about it, and, and we did. Um, uh, the, the Secretary Blinken was 100 percent right that, uh, first of all, it wasn't, it wasn't our place to, uh, uh, to, uh, to tell Poland what to do or not to do. And that was the main point that he was trying to make. But he also indicated accurately that we're, we were having an interagency discussion inside the administration about, about this idea. Um, we have had those discussions. The, uh, the, the polls uh, put out a statement last night about this transferring of the U.S. custody. We talked about that. And again, I came out here today to, uh, to read out to you uh, uh, where we ended up landing on that. If you have time for one more real quick, uh, we've heard a lot about the help uh, given to the Ukrainians, but is the Pentagon monitoring uh, actors that could be assisting the Russians right now? Monitoring actors? Whether it be China, Iran, other countries that could be working with Russia while they're now viewed as a pariah on the world stage. Oh, look, I'm not going to talk about uh, uh, intelligence issues here. Uh, uh, we're obviously scanning the, the threat landscape uh, as broadly and as deeply as we can. And certainly uh, we, we have taken note that the, the Chinese, for instance, uh, um, have, um, have at the very least provided a, a tacit level of approval for what, what Russia has done, uh, even to the point of blaming the United States for this war, incredibly. Um, and, uh, and again, we're, we're, we're constantly looking at the threat landscape, and I don't really have anything more to add on that. Jenny. Thank you, Dan. I uh, have two questions. First question is, uh, Russia has designated South Korea and the uh, United States, its allies, as non-friendly nations. And uh, Putin's retaliation against the South Korea has already begun. What is your comment on uh, Russia's action on this? I think I think our actions speak louder than any comment or words I could offer here today, Jenny. We uh, continue to look for ways to support Ukraine in their defense. We're grateful that the South Koreans, our allies, have also uh, levied sanctions and being willing to, to, uh, to offer support. Um, uh, I think that's indicative of uh, our close friendship and partnership, but also more indicative of, of, uh, of the South Korean government and, and their, their concerns. Uh, about what Russia is doing. Secondly, uh, yesterday uh, at the U.S. congressional hearing, uh, U.S. Uh, Strategic Commander General Richard said, Admiral Richards. Uh, uh, yeah, Admiral, I'm sorry. Uh, North Korea's. Yeah, I see. Is that right? Thank you. Good. Uh -huh. uh, 
North Korea's ICBM nuclear tests are likely to increase in the future. What strategy does the U.S. have in the response to North Korea's escalate tensions in Korean Peninsula? Uh, look, Jenny, I would point you to uh, what uh, Indo-PACOM just put out earlier this morning. We've made clear our concern over the significant increase in DPRK missile testing activity which we continue to believe undermines peace and security and is destabilizing the region as well as the international community. So in light of that, um, as we've noted earlier this week, uh, U.S. Indo-Pacific Command ordered intensified intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance collection activities in the Yellow Sea, as well as enhanced readiness among our ballistic missile defense forces in, in the region. So again, uh, I think uh, in our case here, actions are speaking louder than words. We uh, we have made clear what our concerns are, and we're acting on those concerns. Thank you. Yeah, Mike. John, uh, the Defense Department was tasked uh, pretty much on the fly with finding uh, billets, billets for thousands of refugees after the fall of Afghanistan. Are you try is the Pentagon trying to sort of look at get ahead of this task? I mean, get ahead of this to prepare for if it happens, if you have to do it again uh, with, with regard to any people from. Uh, from Ukraine. Well, you know, we're just uh, uh, getting closer to wrapping up Operation Allies Welcome, uh, and we were very proud to be a part of that, uh, this DHS-led mission to provide a safe and secure environment for Afghan evacuees to, uh, to get on with their new lives here as, uh, as American citizens, and we're very proud of that. Uh, I know of no such similar efforts uh, underway that would utilize Defense Department property or facilities or resources uh, with respect to Ukrainian evacuees, uh, but uh, again, that, that would be really uh, something better directed to DHS and the State Department. But I, there's no active efforts right now that, uh, for DOD participation in that kind of a move. Um, and look, Mike, I mean, the, the, these the U, Ukrainians that have had to flee, I, I suspect they want to go home, to their home, um, to a country that's not being bombed and shelled um, and not invaded by, by Russia. Uh, I, I, would, I would imagine that's what they really want, that they're not looking for new homes. They want to go back to their homes, and they have every right to do that. And the, what needs to happen is this war needs to end. And Mr. Putin, for all the options he has available to him, he still has the option of diplomacy and ending this war, which he has certainly within the power, his power to do it, so that these two million plus people now can go back to their own homes where, where they obviously belong and want to be. Uh, yeah, in the back there. Yeah, uh, Obey with Marine Corps Times. Uh, thank you. With yeah. cold response, uh, the Marine Corps originally planned on sending 5,000 Marines uh, to Norway. That's now been reduced to 3,000. Is that troop reduction in any way connected with uh, what's going on in Ukraine? I don't think there's any connection to what's going on in Ukraine, but I would refer you to the Marine Corps to speak to the, how they're resourcing the exercise. And second question, there's, uh, from what I understand, about 14,000 uh, troops kind of uh, activated or potentially activated to uh, head to Eastern Europe as part of the NATO response. Correct. Is there a potential reason why, or why is there no real Marine Corps unit part of that? I mean, look, we we feel to we we feel to need we feel to requirement. Um, and uh, right now, the kinds of enablers that have been uh, needed by our NATO allies have uh, we've you know largely come from the Army and the Air Force. There's, there's certainly no, uh, no no overt reason uh, why there hasn't been Marine Corps units uh, put on prepare to deploy or sent over. Uh, I, I wouldn't rule anything in or out going forward. The Secretary has always wanted to keep his options on the table to be able to provide additional force flow, even from the United States. Uh, so we'll see where this goes. Yeah. Uh, I didn't get anybody on the phone yet. Uh, I'm going to be in big trouble here. Uh, Paul Shinkman. Yeah, hi, John. Two questions, please. Uh, one on the Russian convoy and another on Russia's use of conscripted, conscripted troops. Can you at all quantify the Russian column attempting to advance on Kyiv, like the number of troops or resources within it, and any other resources that Russia has deployed to either get it moving or to prevent those troops from freezing to death? And then secondly, can you comment on, or do you have any insights on the recent developments regarding Russia's use of conscripted troops? Can you confirm that they've recalled some of these forces and that their deployment to the front lines was seemingly the result of some kind of mistake? Thank you. 
Okay, a lot there. Um, on the convoy, I, I don't have a lot of additional context here. Uh, our assessment is this uh, was largely a resupply convoy. Our assessment is still that it, it remains uh, stalled and is not moving. Uh, it has been attacked by Ukrainian armed forces with quite some effect. Um, and uh, and uh, our assessment is it has not been able to come to the relief of advanced columns that are moving on uh, on, on Kyiv. Uh, I, I have not and will not get into estimating the length of it or how many vehicles or what kind of vehicles are in it. Uh, we don't have that level of detail. Um, and uh, on conscripts, uh, we certainly, uh, and we've been talking about this for a while, I mean, we certainly have seen that, um, that some of the initial uh, uh, battalion tactical groups that were sent into Ukraine in the early days uh, had conscripts in the force. We've been very careful not to provide a ratio or a number because we don't know. We, we, we're not experts on uh, rushing, ru Russian manning and, and, and how they organize their units. But we certainly had reliable indicators uh, that a good many of these troops were conscripts. Um, again, how many, we don't know. What, the, what their fate is now, we don't, we don't know. Um, uh, I saw the statement out of the Kremlin about the offer and their, their numbers. I think, they, I can't remember what it was, several hundred or something like that. Uh, I don't think I need to tell any of you this, but I would look upon any piece of data that you get from the Kremlin with great skepticism. Um, let's see. Uh, Tony Capaccio, Bloomberg. Hi, John. Quick question on Russia's cyber warfare capability in, in Ukraine. You remember a military analyst predicted before the invasion that Russia would unleash the full brunt of its cyber capability to cripple Ukraine's infrastructure. What's DOD's assessment of the extent of that use to date? It doesn't seem extensive. Yeah, I mean, I... Uh... Again, we don't have perfect visibility into everything that the Russians are doing in, in cyberspace. Uh, what, what, what we can do, Tony, is, is speak to outcomes. Uh, we believe that, uh, um, that there hasn't been so far a devastating uh, cyber effects on, on Ukraine, although that we have noted uh, cyber attacks, cyber disruptions, websites being taken down, um, and um, attempts to limit uh, uh, communications. Uh, certainly we've seen all that, um, and we would expect that those efforts by the Russians would continue. Again, this is very much a part of their playbook. Um, I would note that the Ukrainians are, are not neophytes when it comes to uh, cyber operations. Uh, we have helped uh, over time, o over these many years, to help improve their resiliency in cyberspace, and I think some of that resiliency is, is, uh, is on display as well. I mean, um, uh, that the Russians may not have had devastating effects in cyberspace doesn't just have to be because the Russians decided not to have devastating effects in cyberspace, but rather because perhaps the Ukrainians uh, uh, have improved their ability to be, uh, to be resilient. Uh, Phil Stort, Reuters. Hey there. Uh, just could you uh, give a little more uh, information about this high-risk assessment? Is there anything that's in the public realm uh, that you could cite that explains uh, why these uh, combat aircraft transfers would be seen as high risk, and and uh, and you know, is this a, a new red line um, by the U.S. government about things that it won't do uh, to support Ukraine, or is this uh, somehow related to the pre-existing red line about you know no no troops even in, in airspace? Thanks. We're not drawing a red line here, Phil. We're, we're giving you an honest assessment of uh, of how we. Uh, came to our conclusions about this particular proposal of MiG-29s that would be transferred to U.S. custody and then given to Ukraine. Um, that, that's what we're here to talk about. That's what that's the decision that we made. Um, I, as I answered to court, we're constantly, with, with every decision we're making, with every uh, piece of material and, and system that we're providing, we're always going through the calculus of, of, uh, uh, of the, 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 of the need uh, and the potential risk of providing uh, that need. And we're going to continue to do that uh, that going forward. And I'm not going to get into uh, the specifics, uh, uh, the, the sausage making of how the, this particular decision got made. I walked through the three justifications. The, the secretary is very comfortable uh, with, uh, with this decision and with those three justifications, and I'm going to just leave it at that. Uh, Oscar from Polish News. Oh, thank you. Thank you for, for this opportunity. Uh, could you talk a little bit more on, about 
why you think that uh, sending this these um, MIGs would be of little uh, use to Ukraine? Is it because of the um, um, surface to air missile coverage or and and it seems like uh, well you, you've been talking about this issue as more of a logistical challenge but now it seems like it's more of a political military issue um and if i may uh, also just a quick question about the patriots is is that uh, just a temporary deployment thank you Oscar, I'm going to point you back to my opening statement. I think uh, I, I think I answered your question, uh, your first question, pretty well with that opening statement, and I, I don't know that I can improve upon it. And so, trying would probably be folly for me. And, and as for the Patriot missiles, uh, 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 yes, this is a temporary uh, deployment to, to Poland, uh, given the circumstances that we're in. These Patriot batteries uh, were already had already been deployed into Germany, uh, and I suspect that the appropriate time they'll go back there. Okay, I think that's all the time we have for today. Thanks very much, and um, we'll see you guys later this week. Yeah.